recording. Amy, do you want to make some preliminary remarks or shall I just launch into it? Yes, definitely. All right, so thank you so much, you guys, for um, joining us for our very first uh, Stream Team Academy virtual workshop um, that we are calling Creek Courses, um, because it's not just one, but it's several different courses that we're going to do over uh, the time period up until September 18th on Missouri mussels. Um, this workshop actually would have been held in person this weekend um, on the 29th and 30th, uh, a full day workshop with a field portion, but due to COVID-19 concerns, um, we decided to try it, to do it virtually this way. So hopefully you can still get a lot out of it. Um, the great thing about doing things virtually is that we can invite folks who aren't uh, stream team members to come and join in and get some of that really great information um, that our experts have to offer. And then hopefully um, bring folks into the stream team program as well. So um, we're very appreciative of everybody, um, especially your patience on, this is our first attempt to do this live virtually. So if there are technical difficulties, I apologize. We're all, kind of dealing with that on all sides of the issues. So, um, but I would like to um, introduce our presenter for tonight. Dr. Chris Barnhart um, is with the is with Missouri State University. So he is presenting from Springfield. Um, I think we have a lot of folks who are kind of coming from all over the state joining us today. So it's kind of really cool that we can do this virtually. Uh, from all over the place. Um, so Chris, Dr. Barnhart um, has a very um, deep interest in freshwater mussels and it dates back to his childhood experiences um, in Midwestern rivers and takes him to the wilds of Kansas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Europe, China, New Zealand, all over the world. So um, very well renowned as far as um, being a, an expert in muscle biology. And we've appreciated all of the contributions that he's made to the Stream Team program in teaching muscle workshops in the past. Um, you know, other than that, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's really great to have you, Dr. Barnhart, and I will go ahead and turn it over to you. Thanks, Amy, I guess. It's kind of hard to follow that kind of an introduction. But uh, yeah, the, the muscles will help out here. I wanted to, to start out by not being an apologist for muscles, but you know, a lot of people, even people that are interested in streams don't know much about muscles and may not have ever noticed muscles, uh, except as a few dead shells on the bank, but they're actually uh, very diverse and they, they can have very high biomass in streams. So uh, these numbers, I guess I better hide my little menu here. These numbers show the, the numbers of species, so the, the raw biodiversity of some of the major groups of freshwater critters. So aquatic insects, of course, dominate diversity in the water just like they do on land. Uh, 7,850 freshwater uh, aquatic insects. And then number two is the crustaceans, you know, the other arthropod group with about 1,500 species. But the mollusks, and this is a group that clams and snails and mussels uh, belong to, isn't uh, too distant second here with, with over a thousand species. And then fish come in, again, about the same. So these three, group, three groups are all very important, but fishes and, uh, and even crayfishes are better known to most stream folks than, than uh, freshwater mollusks are. Well, we're here to correct that. And I wanted to tell you uh, what a mollusk is too. The mollusks are a phylum and you know arthropods are a phylum, uh, vertebrates are a subphylum and uh, within the phylum there's an awful lot of diversity just like there's a lot of diversity in the vertebrate phylum. You've got little tiny things like this Carichium land snail which is about the size of a, a grain of rice on up to the giant squid which might be 60 feet long. And uh, it is, in fact, in terms of diversity, the second largest phylum after the arthropods. It's got 
about 73,000 living species and lots of fossil records. So it's a very diverse group. And it's found in all the major habitats. It's found in the ocean. It's found in freshwater, the subject tonight, but also on land. There's a great diversity of land snails as well. And there are seven living classes. So these are the major branches within the phylum mollusca. And of course, everybody's familiar with snails. The gastropods are actually the largest living class of mollusks with 59,000 species. And the bivalves are number two with about 10,000 species. Uh, the other living classes have much lower species diversity, but that doesn't mean they're necessarily obscure. Everybody knows the cephalopods, of course, because they're big and uh, potential human food and these other groups are, are somewhat more obscure. So bivalves. And if you are into the seashore or scuba diving, you probably have a better appreciation of bivalve diversity than if your experience is only in freshwater. Uh, 10,000 living species of bivalves, but only about 12% of those live in freshwater. The vast majority of bivalve diversity is marine. And they're often very large and they're often very abundant. So they play important ecological roles. And that's, that's true in freshwater too, not, not just in marine. If you wanted to describe uh, what a bivalve is, and by the way, I can't see my thumbnail. So I don't know if you guys can see me. Amy, can you tell me if you can see me or not? I'd let my hair down if I had any. Yes, I, I can see you, Chris. Okay, well, I'll, I'll try not to pick my nose now that I know that you can see me. Okay, so uh, here's bivalves. You know, they've got two shells and they're hinged dorsally, right? So this structure right here is called the ligament and it's an elastic connection of these two, uh, these two plates, the two sides of the shell. So that's a ligament. And then uh, the gills, which are shown in blue here, are ciliated, covered with the same little hairs that, that line the airways in your lungs. But in this case, those cilia beat to propel a current of water. And that current of water actually comes in through an aperture at the back, a tube-like opening. It actually passes through the gills and they're hollow. And then it comes back out in internal water passage through the X current aperture. So there's a constant and really very complex water flow through the animals. And this is how they capture food. Almost all bivalves, not quite, but almost all bivalves capture their food by filtering it from the water. And the filtration takes place on these gills, these ciliated gills. Then the food is passed down to the edge of the gill and ciliary mechanisms carry it up to the mouth. So this is where the mouth is. And then there's a digestive tract Nice simple diagram. There's also a foot and the foot is used for burrowing and crawling and it has a gland in it called a byssus gland that secretes protein threads that the animal can use certain species, certain life stages use to tie themselves down to a hard surface. So that's your, your very basic anatomy of a bivalve. And there's lots of words for bivalves, lots of common names. So you've got mussel and you've got clam and you've got oyster bivalve. What does this all mean? Bivalve, of course, is a descriptive term. It means two valves. And there are other bivalved organisms. For example, wow. uh, a, lot of, a lot of times in our limestone, you'll find what look like clam fossils, but they're not. They're uh, an extinct group called the brachiopods. And uh, there's bivalve crustaceans too. There's little clam shrimps that you'd swear were a small clam until they stick their legs out and start walking around. So bivalve is, it's a name of an order, but it's, it's also, I'm sorry, a class of mollusca, but it's also a descriptive term. Mussel kind of refers to shape and it's a bivalve that has sort of a pear shape to it. And it's used as the common name for three different taxonomic bivalve groups. The native mussels, which are the unionids, and th those are the ones that we're you're here to talk about mainly tonight. But we are going to talk a little bit about the drysenids. This includes the zebra and the quagga mussels and some marine species, but uh, they're mainly freshwater. And then the middleoids, which are a marine group. And these three groups are not particularly closely related to each other, but they're convergent in shape. 
Clam is uh, generally used for burrowing bivalves. If you're talking about marine bivalves, but it's okay to use it for mussels. In my opinion, you can call them clams. Most freshwater folks reserve it for the Asian clam, which is an invasive species that, uh, again, we'll talk a little bit about it, but clam is okay. And then oyster, that's uh, very specific, it is bivalves that cement their shell to the substrate that actually glue themselves on to a hard substrate. And there are convergent lineages of oysters. There's even freshwater oysters that are in fact unionids, but oyster, it's sort of like a morphological or behavioral trait, not a taxon. In fact, all of these terms are just descriptive. They're not really taxa. Okay, uh, how do they move? Uh, they've got this rigid shell, but that doesn't help much. What they need is some kind of a muscular structure and that's the foot. And they can pump hemolymph or blood into the foot uh, to expand it. And then it's got muscles in it that can pull it back. So uh, the closest analogy to this, and it's not a particularly good one, is, uh, is your tongue, right? So your tongue is, is flexible, doesn't have any bones in it. Now we don't pump hemolymph into it to expand it. The tongue is not an erectile tissue, but everybody knows what an erectile tissue is. Bivalve foot is erectile, but it's also muscular and they can move it around just as agilely as, uh, as a tongue can be moved. Usually they burrow with the foot and they can project it down into the substrate by that hydraulic action of pumping hemolymph into it. And then they can spread the tip of it and then muscles contract and it can pull the animal down in. And they're very effective burrowers. Uh, freshwater bivalves aren't the most impressive burrowers. Uh, some of the marine bivalves can, can burrow almost like watching a mole go down into the ground. But they go down head first and the posterior end is up with the apertures so that they can access the water. So they're face down. If they had a face, they'd be face down in the substrate. And most of the action is back at the posterior end because that's where the water comes and goes. So I've got a, a video clip here, and this is, uh, is actually um, an Asian clam. Oh, come on. Here we go. And this is speeded up. Asian clams aren't particularly fast. They're about the same speed as our native mussels of similar size. So this is speeded up tenfold. And you'll see the animal, its foot is coming out over here, and it's probing, Look, looks like a tongue. And you'll also notice that it's, it's able to adhere to the grains of sand here, and they're being entrained and pulled up on the surface of the foot. And that's the action of cilia that are on the surface of the foot and adhesion of mucus. These are the apertures at the back. The ventral one is where the water goes in. The dorsal one is where it comes out. And now the animal, like I described, is pushing its foot down into the substrate, expanding the tip, and then pulling back to draw the shell down in. And you might notice here too that as it pulls itself down with these successive extensions of the foot, it clamps the shell when it's going down and then expands it again. And that, of course, makes it more streamlined for uh, penetrating the substrate. Now, uh, native mussels, when they're little, are quite mobile. These are Freshly metamorphosed Margaritifera falcata. This is the, the Western pearl shell, not a mussel that we have in Missouri, although we have a, a relative called the spectacle case. And to me, they, they seem like little snails at this stage of their development. And they're moving around pretty constantly. They're also, although you can't see it, they're also laying down an invisible thread behind them as they crawl. And that's the byssus thread. When Mussels are very small, almost inevitably, they're producing a byssus thread, sort of like when spiders walk around, they're uh, leaving a thread behind them in case they should fall. Well, the little mussels, they don't want to be swept away by a current, so they're anchoring themselves as they move about with a byssus thread. Once they get to be adults, they, for the most part, just auger in. You know, they, they dig down, and these are the two apertures of an individual mussel here. And here's another muscle buried right beside it. And here's another. The in-current apertures are a little bit larger and the ex-current apertures are smaller. The in-current apertures tend to have papillae, kind of a coarse filter so that sand and so on can't get in. Somebody's not muted. Could you 
please mute yourself. Oh, we're going to have to go looking for you. We're going to have to listen to the dishes being washed. Yeah, okay. I can see if I can try to find the offender. I don't see him. I don't see him. Maybe you can. Um, I, I don't. Well, it's gone now anyway. Yeah, let's move on. <laughs> All right. Oh my God, this is so cool. Thank you <laughs> so much. So, buried mussels. And, uh, you know, we've, we've gone out and found mussels that Heidi Dunn marked 10 years before, and that same mussel is sitting in the same spot. Particularly big, heavy mussels, they stop moving at a certain age, and they basically stay in one place their whole lives. Now, some bivalves tie themselves down. Most native mussels only produce byssus when they're little, and it's not a permanent attachment. They're kind of using it as they're moving about. But uh, zebra mussels and quagga mussels and the middle of type mussels do tie themselves down somewhat permanently with byssus. Now they can, excuse me for a moment, <laughs> they can let loose. Zebra mussels tie themselves down like this, but they can let loose and move about. They generally don't though after they become adult. When they're little, they're quite mobile and they'll, they'll pick up and go somewhere else. But uh, as they get big, they tend to, to stay put. And this is actually why zebra mussels and quagga are such a problem because they attach to surfaces and they uh, become a nuisance as a result. Again, little mussels, little native mussels do produce byssus, but it's not a very permanent attachment. And after they get past a centimeter or so, they stop doing it. Once they're big enough and heavy enough that they don't have to worry about being blown away on a water current, then they'll stop producing byssus. But at this size, if they're happy, they make lots of byssus threads. And if you've got a bunch of them, as we do when we culture them, uh, you can pick up a, a gang like this. Again, the, the business of the zebra mussel is a major reason that it has such an impact. It can tie itself down inside of pipes. Here it is blocking a plumbing pipe. As long as there's water moving through and as long as that water has food in it, you know, potentially uh, the zebra mussels can live in that situation. But eventually they'll actually clog the pipe up and, and uh, you know, I think I forgot. Nope, I'm okay. I was going to say I forgot to start the recording, but I guess I started it. <laughs> uh, golf balls, you know, this interferes a lot with golfers. No, not really. But, uh, you know, sometimes these things do get into the, the plumbing for a golf course. Oftentimes if a golf course is near a stream, they'll take water from the stream and they'll use that for irrigation. And if uh, zebra mussels or if Asian clams get into that system, they're a little larvae can go off and establish themselves elsewhere in the system is wherever there's water flowing and eventually clog it up. So they actually can be a problem on golf courses. Okay, um, I'm just a very little bit of taxonomy here. We've got two, I'll call them orders, although this one is kind of a grab bag, two phylogenetic orders of freshwater bivalves. The unionids are the, the native pearly mussels and we have two families in North America. There are six worldwide. So that's the one order, the native pearly mussels. And then we've got the veneroids. And the veneroids include a collection of native fingernail clams, the spherids, which are little bitty guys. And they're interesting, but not nearly as interesting as, as the unionids. So we, we don't talk much about them. And then we've got corbicula. And we've got at least three different kinds of corbicula. But they're, they're a very weird case because uh, at least two of those lineages are, are uh, just clones. They reproduce asexually and they're all identical. Each of those lineages is identical. Every individual is identical. I don't know about the third species yet. Don't know if it's known. And then we've got two species of Dreisenids, the zebra and the quagga mussel. Okay, let's go inside and, and see how they're made. So the shell as a characteristic shape, and you have to think of this as a, as a record of growth. When the animal starts out, it's very small, grain of salt size. 
And then as it grows, it adds shell to the edge of the valves and to the inside. So the shells are getting thicker and they're getting longer and taller, you know, in linear dimension. And the growth lines here that are characteristic represent periods in time when the animals stop growing. And these tend to be annual, but these growth lines can also form if there's some other pause. It could be a pause because of high water that puts a lot of sediment in the water, or it could be a pause because of low water where the water becomes stagnant and the animal stops feeding. But for the most part, they're annual. And so they, they give you a chronology of the animal's growth. And that's one of the reasons that mussels are so interesting. Okay, uh, the part where it started, the oldest part of the shell is called the umbone. And then there's an anterior end, that's where the head would be if it had one, a posterior end where the apertures are, with the excurrent on the dorsal side toward the hinge, and the incurrent aperture toward the ventral side, which is where the shell opens up and the foot comes out. Okay, we'll take the shell off now. And if you want to take the shell off, you have to cut the muscles that, that hold it together. And there's two large adductors, an anterior adductor indicated here and a posterior adductor. And if you've ever looked inside a muscle shell, and I'm, I'm sure that, that we'll hear more about that later, that there are marks in the shell where you can see where these and other muscles attach. That's M-U-S-C-L-E-S -E type muscles attached to the shell. Uh, here's the foot and the gills, and there's a couple of structures that are rather like the gills. They're ciliated, but these are the labial palps, and they're food handling devices. And then the apertures are back here, and the apertures of a freshwater mussel are just formed by two halves that are held together when the shell is closed. And if you pry the shell open, well, they come apart. They're not a permanent tube is what I'm saying. Okay, and then uh, of course, in order to illustrate things here, we had to cut some stuff. Uh, the, sh the tissue that lines the shell is called the mantle and it also secretes the shell. Don't have it labeled. All right, now we're gonna go further inside. Uh, again, if the, if the muscle had a head, this is where it would be. And if it had eyes, this is where they would be. But muscles don't have eyes. It doesn't mean they're not sensitive to light. They're quite capable of, of detecting shadows. And uh, you can prove this to yourself if you keep them in an aquarium. And if you just shine a light on them, you can get them to respond. So there seem to be light sensitive shells uh, distributed underneath the shell on, on the mantle. Light sensitive cells under the shells, but no eyes. Now we're gonna go ahead and cut this guy in half and lay them open so that we can see the insides and a little bit more detail of the shell in this diagram. There's some points of articulation that help to keep the shells from shifting from side to side. And these are called teeth. Uh, and there's ridges that are also called teeth. So you've got the laterals and the cardinals and the pseudocardinals, but you'll learn more about shell anatomy later. What we want to look at here is, is the the stuff that's inside. And the first thing I want you to notice is that the gills are hollow. The gills are hollow and the hollow gills are separated into vertical spaces by lamellae or septa. And these are tissue connections between the, the two sides of this hollow flap-like structure. All right. Now, where does the, the water come in? The water comes in through the incurrent aperture and then it goes through openings called ostea, they're, they're pores, and it goes into these hollow spaces inside the gill. And once it's in there, it moves dorsally and goes up into what are called the dorsal passages. And there's one above each of these two plate or flap-like gills on each side of the animal. And there the water moves posterior and then out the excurrent aperture. So the important point here is this is where all, most, not all, but most of the water movement is, is back here through these apertures. It actually goes into the gills before it comes back out of the animal. Now, it doesn't have to go through this incurrent aperture because the mantle isn't fused down here ventrally. You know, it opens up. 
And that's the same space that the water coming in the in current aperture enters into. So water can be taken up ventrally and even anteriorly unless the animal keeps those two sides of the mantle close together. When they're little, they take water in all along the margin, not just at the posterior. When they get bigger and they're buried, almost all of the water movement is through the in current aperture. But the water going out is always coming out the X current because the water movement is driven by the gills. They're, they're pumping the water into themselves and back out again. Now, unionids are, are one of a, about 40 orders of bivalves. There's a lot of diversity on the, the order level in the, in the bivalvia, in the class bivalvia. So what's special about the unionids? Well, it's their life cycle. They've got this weird life cycle where there is a parasitic larval stage that has to attach to the gills or skin of fish. There's one species that we know uses an amphibian. It's the salamander mussel but almost all of them use fish. And there's maybe a couple that can do a direct metamorphosis where they don't have to be parasitic, but those are the exceptions that prove the rule right there. Essentially all of the 840 some species of this order um, have this parasitic larval stage. Sometimes the larva is very different. Um, there's various kinds of parasitic larvae among the different families, but uh, but this is the distinctive thing, and there's no other kinds of bivalves other than this order that have parasitic larvae, to my knowledge. So the female mussel releases tiny larvae called glochidia. Grain of salt size. This isn't to scale. They're much, much smaller than the female. They have to attach to a fish, and there they become encapsulated by the tissue of the fish. So the tissue of the fish actually grows over them, and there they sit for a matter of weeks days to weeks to months, depending on the species and the temperature, and they undergo a metamorphosis from this larva to the juvenile stage. The glochidia doesn't have much anatomy. It's, it's really just a little Pac-Man thing that can close on the gill. But after its metamorphosis, it has everything it needs. It's got the tinnitia that can pump the water. It's got the foot, the nervous system, intestine, everything but gonads when they uh, come off the fish. And they generally don't grow very much during that metamorphosis. It's just a, a continuing embryonic development, you might say, on the fish. Well, I left out uh, one important stage here. That's the, the gametes, you know. How do they make babies? Well, when they spawn, the males release aggregates of sperm called sperm balls. The females make eggs, but the eggs aren't released into the water. Most bivalves do release eggs into the water, but unionids and, and also the uh, corbicula clams and the fingernail clams, they, uh, they brood their eggs. The females brood their eggs inside those same hollow spaces in their gills. So this is the stage called brooding. And this occurs again, inside the gills of the female. After the larvae are mature, they leave the mother or sometimes they're taken away. Sometimes they're released in devious ways to attract fish. And if they're lucky, you know, one in hundreds of thousands will find its way onto a fish and undergo its metamorphosis. If they don't get onto the right kind of fish, they die. And only a very few of them make it through that bottleneck. When they come off the fish, they're free living from then on. They, they feed and they grow and they depending on the species, they might live for 100 years. It's not unusual for mussels to live for decades. And there's a few that, that crack the century mark. But most of them, you know, in the neighborhood of, of 10 to 40 years is, is kind of a, a typical range. Here's the, uh, the male side of the, the spawning business. This is a little mussel called Trincilla truncata. And how do the males fertilize the females? Well, they release their their milt into the water, and then the water current carries it to the female, and the female filters it out. What happens after that, we really don't know. We don't know what the path is through the female. She's in the business of filtering stuff out of the water, but the stuff she filters out of the water, she swallows or rejects as pseudofeces. So how these sperm get into the, the water tubes where the eggs are is still an open question. But this male is, is spawning. And this goes on for hours or even days. 
it is one long orgasm for a, a male mussel. And these tiny specks that you see in the water now, those are individual spermatozygmata. They're not individual sperm cells. Each one of these things is hundreds of sperm cells aggregated together. And it really kind of amounts to a, a different, uh, different life stage, a multicellular life stage. And this is an individual spermatozygmata. It's lost some of its sperm and it's also expanded. They tend to swell once they're in the water and the sperm become aggregated at one side. And that means that the whole thing can swim through the water. And this is what I mean when I say it's, it's like a separate multicellular life stage. They uh, swim because they don't want to settle to the bottom. They want to be dense enough to stay close to the bottom and they are quite dense. But if they go down into the substrate, they're never going to reach a female muscle. So it's quite possible that they exhibit some taxis, maybe toward the light or away from the dark uh, in order to maintain their position in the water column. Really interesting. They look kind of vaguely like ball box, which is a colonial algae that you might have heard of or seen in freshman biology. Now, if you take uh, the individual sperm, they're much, much smaller. And these are stuck to glass. That's why they're, they're not swimming. These are spermatozygmata now, the sperm balls, and we've just dropped a saline solution, a salt solution onto them from a pipette. And what you'll see when we do that is it will trigger the activation of the sperm. They'll start wagging their flagella and then they all disperse away from the sperm ball. This is probably what happens when they reach the female muscle. You know, they're cooperating until they get there and then they bail off and it's every man for himself to try to find an egg and fertilize it. And they, they do respond that way if you expose them to an egg. So if, if you take a, an egg from a female muscle that was not fertilized and you put the sperm balls in the same dish with it, they go crazy. So when they reach the proximity of an egg, they know what to do. There must be a chemical signal from the egg that they detect. What we don't know is how they get in there where the eggs are. Well, where are the eggs? Uh, the female has an ovary. And when she lays her eggs, she lays them into the water tubes inside of her gills. And you might say, well, there's holes there. The sperm must just swim through the holes. Well, maybe, but the sperm are a lot bigger a lot bigger than the particles that are small enough to get through those holes. Muscles are very effectively taken out particulates. Uh, they don't let things through that are bigger than a micron or so. And the sperm are tens of microns in length and about four or five microns in diameter. So it's not at all clear. The other thing is that if you put sperm balls on the gills, they don't know that there's eggs in there. They don't have any way to know that there's eggs in there because the water is going in, it's not coming out. So there's no path for the scent to come out. Well, I gotta get off of this because not all that interesting. It's just one of those open questions. When a female muscle is brooding, at least part of her gills is swollen with eggs. This is uh, Lampsilis teres. And you can see a little bit of her, her gill in its normal dimensions. This is the part of the gill that she uses for brooding her eggs. It's called the marsupium. And you, each one of these is one of those uh, water tubes inside the gill, separated by these tissue junctions, these lamellae. And there might be, you know, could be a million eggs in there if it's a big muscle, and eventually a million glochidia. And they develop in there. And if you were to look in and see what they're doing, well, they're not doing much, but they do start exercising a little bit. They, uh, they start talking, but they're dormant in there. You know, they complete their development, but then they have to wait. And until they hit the water and until they're particularly in the vicinity of a fish, there's really not that much for them to do. And many mussels will brood their embryos after they've completed their development, they'll stay in the female skill for months before a fish comes along and, and uh, they get released. This is another Lampsilis muscle. This is Lampsilis reviana. And you see something really interesting going on here. She's moving and she's got 
flaps of mantle tissue here surrounding her marsupial gill, and that is her marsupial gill there. She's uh, protruded it out from the shell, and she's waving these flaps, and they look like a fish. And you probably heard the story that this is how mussels attract a host for their babies, at least the Lampsaline mussels, this particular tribe. So here's that same kind of mussel, Lampsilus reviana, and some small bass. They strike at the lure, and that ruptures the marsupial gill, and that releases the glochidia into the water. And a few lucky ones will get inhaled by the fish. And once they're inhaled, a few of those will come into contact with the gills, and they'll clamp on, and they'll become encapsulated. And that is how they'll be until they're done. When they're finished with their metamorphosis, they'll come out. Now, they don't force their way out. It's not like that. It's more like there's a chemical signal. Somehow they activate the fish's inflammatory uh, response, and the capsule will break down. And only after it starts to break down and the water reaches the juvenile will it start feeling around with its foot. So it, it seems to be more of a a tissue lysis than uh, any kind of an active burrowing on the part of the juvenile. This is a glochidium attached to a fin. And what I want you to see here is how the fish's tissue forms that capsule. It looks like the whole surface of the, of the fin is moving. And the, these are called keratocytes. They're uh, a class of cell that covers fish. It covers the, the scales and the gills and the fins. These keratocytes are mobile cells. They're kind of like our white blood cells. They're crawling around constantly. And if there's a wound, there's a wound response. And that is for the keratocytes to crawl over whatever's trying to attach. There's lots of kinds of parasites that try to attach to fish. And uh, the keratocytes will, will crawl and eventually form a capsule. And for most parasites, there's bad things that happen then. The immune system causes oxidative reactions to happen and does things that will kill the parasite. And actually, if the wrong kind of glochidia attaches to the wrong fish, they'll be killed by the fish's immune response. Or the capsule will break down, it will become inflamed, and then the tissue will just shed the thing. And both of those things can happen. But if it's a compatible kind of glochidium, if it's a glochidium that can use that kind of a fish as a host, well then, the capsule remains intact, and then the muscle can complete its development. Well, I showed you the Lampsaline lure. The, uh, the tribe is a taxonomic group uh, that's below order, and there's a number of different, uh, it's actually below family, so there's a number of different uh, orders within the family Unionidae, within the order Unionida. And the lampsalines have these mantle flap lures. Uh, they can look like a crayfish. They can look like a minnow. They can look like, I don't know what, something that you'd see in Bass Pro. Uh, this is black sand shell and it's got a, a bone white marsupium. And these, uh, these flaps wave and it's a, it's a walleye lure. That's their primary host is walleye and sauger. So those are mantle lures and that's one category of uh, way to attract a host fish. There's also many, many species that have conglutinates. And conglutinates are aggregations of eggs that are released as a mass from the female. And so these are eggs that are stuck together with each other. And they've got glochidia inside of them. And it's a bait. So a fish that thinks this is something to eat will grab it. And in handling it will rupture the eggs and then the glochidia will be inhaled and get onto the gills. And then there's some other tricks too. One of the most interesting uh, is uh, Epioblasma, the fish trappers. So I'll show you an example of conglutinate and then I'll show you an example of, uh, well, I guess we're gonna start with host capture. Okay, you saw a fish bite a mussel. Now you're gonna see a mussel bite a fish. This is a very successful genus. Well, it was successful evolutionarily. Now it's really on the rocks, on the ropes. It had about 24, 25 species, and there's only a handful of them left. Most of them are extinct, and the, 
the balance are endangered with, uh, I don't know if there's any exceptions. I don't think there's any epiblasma left that aren't on the endangered list. Here's one that uh, is doing reasonably well, uh, even though it's on the endangered list, it's called the oyster mussel. And it's got a mantle lure, little tiny mantle lure. And then it's got these broad white flaps of the mantle that cover the goodies and the female opens up wide, almost like, uh, like a Venus flytrap. And it's got this little lure and then it's got these sharp teeth which is very much like, you know, the projections on a Venus flytrap. So you can guess what's going to happen with these. So they stand up, the females stand up in the substrate and they, they open up like a Venus flytrap. And there's this little lure, which moves, you know, it moves like these little twiddly fingers and then a fish comes by and sees that and says, huh. I hope the video is working all right. That was an old wise fish. And this is actually his second shot at this. It's probably not as, it's probably his 10th shot. This fish obviously knows what's up. Darters are pretty clever fish and they, they figure this out quickly. So we need a, a young, dumb fish. So here's a little baby darter that probably hasn't experienced this muscle before. And the same deal, it sees that little lure and it has to lay its whole body in there and it gets caught. And now what happens is the muscle starts releasing glochidia and it releases them into the mantle with no rupture of the gill necessary. It's got a way of pumping, reversing the flow and pumping water out with glochidia and it basically charges the mantle cavity and the fish is in there struggling and it's getting coated with glochidia. Not only that, but as it struggles, other fish notice this and there's glochidia in the water. So other fish, fish being the social animals they are, will also be infected. Now the muscle lets go as soon as the fish stops struggling and by that time, the fish is in, in pretty bad shape. And this fish died, this particular individual fish died the next day. And that probably happens a lot. Uh, Epioblasma probably kills a lot of its potential hosts, but the fact that, you know, darters tend to be uh, around other darters and because there is this response, this attraction, uh, it's, it's probably acting as live bait. Conglutinates are sometimes amazingly elaborate and mimetic. Again, this is an aggregate of eggs with glochidia inside and the host thinks it's something to eat and then bites it and releases the glochidia. So a muscle that we've got in our streams, at least the north flowing streams around here is, is uh, in Merrimack and uh, the Burbis and uh, it's also in the the upper Arkansas system, the genus Tychobranchus. And it produces these little tiny conglutinates that are mimetic of insect larvae. And they're targeting darters and probably sculpins as well. So they release these things and they've got an adhesive tail that sticks to the rocks or vegetation. The one that we've got in Missouri is, is Tychobranchus occidentalis. And the conglutinates are a pretty good mimic of a black fly larva. And I know that because I've showed these to aquatic entomologists and asked them what they were and they said, oh, well, it's an insect larva, it might be some kind of simulium. So it can fool an entomologist. There is another species on the other side of the big river, the, the fluted kidney shell, Tychobrachus subtenum, and it mimics the pupil stage of the black fly. And there are species coexisting with each other where one is producing these larval type mimics and the other is producing this, this pupil type mimic. Pretty cool. I wish I had some more recent video of this. Most of these videos are kind of old, but you still get the idea. So here's some conglutinates stuck to a rock and uh, the water current moves them a little bit. Darter picks them up, chews on them, they break. And those are the glochidia. 
kind of like eating a jalapeno popper. This particular darter came back multiple times. I think five times it took one on camera. It didn't get tired of it. And it's got glochidia on its gills and it must hurt a little bit, but the visual attraction of this is so great that the darter just wouldn't quit. Well, I'm going to, going to shift gears now. Um, the question, do the glochidia harm the host fish? It depends. Uh, glochidia, if there are a lot of them, and particularly, interestingly, if there's a lot of them and it's not the host, the fish's gills will mount an inflammatory response and will start sloughing tissue. And yeah, you can kill fish with glochidia. But in the state of nature, a very dense infection of glochidia would be very rare. And I think in nature, typically they have negligible effect on the fish. So um, why about biobs are important? And we'll hear more about this, I'm sure, uh, during the other entries in the series here. But I want to talk first a little bit more about their biology, their feeding biology, because that is the, the source of their ecological importance. They're an important link in the food chain. Because they feed on suspended particles, they're feeding very low on the food chain in rivers. They're, they're picking up, you know, the allochthonous material. The terrestrial material is the source of most of the energy in streams. Streams don't have a whole lot of algae production. What they have is a lot of organic material washing in from terrestrial vegetation, and that breaks down. It's, eventually, it's broken down by bacteria, by aquatic insects, and so on, into tiny particles that we call detritus or FPOM, fine particulate organic material. And somebody's got to eat that stuff or that energy is lost. Well, the things that eat it are a few kinds of aquatic insects that have effective filters, but uh, mainly bivalves. Bivalves are very good at filtering out these microscopic particles of detritus, as well as algae and bacteria, on up to about 20 microns. So between one and 20 microns, there's a lot of energy in stream water that's available to bivalves and wouldn't be available to much of anybody else if it weren't for bivalves. They filter a lot of water. Uh, it depends on the species and the circumstances, but you can find published estimates of one to 38 gallons per mussel per day. That's a lot of water. And the speed and the, the rate of filtration per gram is actually highest in the smallest individuals and in the smallest species. And this is just a fact in nature that there is an, an allometry of rate processes where, as the saying goes, a pile of little dogs eats a lot more than one dog that equals them in weight. As you get smaller, you have higher rate processes, higher metabolic rate, higher feeding, so small species of bivalves feed a lot faster than big ones do. And they, uh, they filter the water. So they're acting as a water filter. Here's a, a video clip of a quadrilline mussel filtering. And they don't look like they're doing anything, just sitting there. But if you put some dye into their incurrent aperture, that dye will very rapidly be drawn through the gills. And then it will shoot out the X current aperture. So all of a sudden you realize that muscle is not just laying there, it's processing a lot of water. Now it can't filter the dye particles out there too small, but if there were say bacteria in that water, it would be filtering all of them out. Very high uh, percentages. Now I said that little muscles filter faster. So here's a fingernail sized muscle. And you can see that it's processing water at a terrific rate. And that water is coming in ventrally. It's not just coming in the incurrent aperture here. It's coming in ventrally. It's coming in anterior, wherever the shell is open. And then it's all shooting out the back. Actually, there's one other thing I want you to see here. That is a fecal pellet. That's muscle poop. And that might seem silly to point out, but it's actually very important. Here's a bunch of uh, Asian clams in a beaker. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna pollute this water. We're gonna add a bunch of, of diatoms, a bunch of algae to the water. And then we're gonna switch to time-lapse. And we're gonna watch what the corbicula do with those diatoms. Here we go. 
and we've compressed about 30 minutes into a minute or less here. Notice all the water movement and also notice the chunky stuff. Well, that's again, muscle feces and also a product called pseudo feces. Boom. So that's what, what bivalves do. They, they take that suspended stuff out of the water and they turn it into bivalves and they turn it into chunky stuff that will settle out on the bottom. So they're transferring that material, not only into themselves, but also from the water column down to the bottom where it becomes available to other organisms because it's now chunky instead of being microscopic. So this is from the Lakes of Missouri volunteer program. And it's kind of an interesting diagram here because most people, we've all been groomed by the conservation department ads and we consider zebra mussels to be a bad thing and they are a bad thing, but they do what other bivalves do. They just do it better. They remove algae, bacteria, F palm from the water column. They turn it into zebra mussels, but they, release a lot of it as what are called biodeposits, or here it's called waste. Some of those nutrients will mix back into the water, but a lot of them will be eaten by other aquatic invertebrates, by snails and aquatic insects, and then those in turn will be eaten by still other aquatic organisms. And now we've got a cycle. When these animals die, of course, they'll become detritus and bacteria as well. So this is the food chain here. and. Filter feeders are an important part of the food chain in aquatic systems. This stuff wouldn't be available if there weren't filter feeders. Bivalve feces and pseudo feces are an important food resource for other animals. And what are pseudo feces? Well, this is one kind of pseudo feces. You can buy this at the, at the dime store, what used to be called the dime store, but pseudo feces are stuff that the muscle filtered out, but it didn't swallow. So it hasn't gone through the digestive tract. And if there's a lot of particles in the water, the muscles will only swallow part of what they filter and the rest of it, they'll bind up with mucus and they'll dump it. I happen to have a picture of muscle poop here. And this poop is special because we fed the muscle plastic beads, polystyrene beads, which came out in the feces and kind of give you a, a scale reference. So you can see, that the particles in this uh, dropping are very much smaller than these 10 micron beads. Here's a really nice experiment that was done uh, almost a decade ago now by Lemon Powers. They caged a kind of fish in stream in California. And these are larval lampreys. Now, you probably think of lampreys as bloodsuckers, but many well, the larvae of most lampreys and the adults of, of quite a few of them are detritivores. They feed on, they're like earthworms. They, they basically feed on the sediments, okay? Well, mussels, they make sediment. So uh, the experiment was that they caged larval lampreys with and without mussels. And this is the change in larval length over the experimental period, which was 80 days. And the lampreys didn't grow nearly as fast alone as they did if they were caged with mussels. And the explanation for that is obvious that the, uh, the mussels were concentrating organic material from the water and making it available to these detritivores, the, uh, the larval lampreys. There, there's a need for more experiments like that. Uh, certainly be fun to do experiments with aquatic insects and, and even larval fish. Um, Quentin Phelps used to work for NBC and he's an ichthyologist here now, did a nice experiment with another kind of poop. He looked at silver carp feces. Uh, silver carp, you know, are filter feeders too. And they produce voluminous feces that are still very rich in organic material. Well, I won't say the catfish were lucky, but, but Quentin raised catfish, feeding them nothing but the feces of silver carp and they did quite well. I hope that the aquaculture interests don't learn about this. He didn't tell me what they tasted like, but uh, you know, feces are a resource and it's, it's a, a kind of uh, link in the food chain. There's a lot of things that eat mussels, uh, raccoons like them, muskrats like them, otters like them. There's turtles, 
that uh, are actually specialized morphologically for feeding on mussels. Some populations of map turtles will uh, crush both snails and bivalves. Uh, red horse are said to feed on bivalves when they get the chance. Uh, large ictalurid catfish, the same, and freshwater drum. Uh, freshwater drum, it turns out, is a very important host. It, it's the host for a lot of species of mussels. And it's not surprising that it's co-evolved with them because it, it eats them. So in eating them and chewing them up, it's going to be exposed to glochidia. And of course, the mussels can track a host that's, that's feeding on them. It makes it very easy for them to, to adapt to that host. There's a lot of invert, invertebrates that will eat small mussels too. And of course, people. Uh, this is one of the questions that you get if you're, if you're uh, working with mussels in streams, people come up and they say, well, can you eat them? And the answer is yes, you can, but you don't want to because they don't taste that great. Fur-bearing mammals uh, definitely use them. And one of the best ways to collect shells is to find a place where a raccoon or a muskrat has, has been feeding because what they'll do is they'll tend to collect the animals and then bring them up to a favorite perch. And sometimes you can find a lot of shells. And all of these shells actually came out of a hollow log here on the Merrimack River. Well, because mussels are filter feeders and because they filter a lot of water, there's a potential for bioremediation. It might be possible to use mussels to clean up eutrophicated bodies of water. This is a, it's a catchy idea. Uh, it's not going to work in every circumstance. Uh, you need a very abundant bi bivalve. And unfortunately, the bivalves that tend to be abundant and have very high filtration rates are the very ones that we worry about, like zebra mussels, for example. And zebra mussels can have a huge impact. Unfortunately, it's sometimes a negative impact. But I think a lot of people that live around the Great Lakes appreciate the increase in water clarity that the zebra mussels brought. They just don't appreciate all the negative side of the zebra mussels. So there are attempts to use native mussels and augment, or native bivalves, in this case oysters, and augment their numbers so that they become effective filter feeders. For the last uh, three years, we've been involved in a project in New Zealand. I've got a former student, Bob Brown, who works over there. And uh, he proposed a project that was funded and we've been able to make three trips over there now to New Zealand to work with a, a Maori tribe. And the interest for, of the Maori is, is cultural and also ecological. And they've got a cultural tradition of, of dredging the very abundant freshwater mussels uh, that occurred in the lakes in New Zealand and, and using them as food and using them as, uh, as raw material for manufacture. And there's lots of these shallow lakes in New Zealand and uh, agricultural runoff uh, from sheep and, and dairy has impacted a lot of these lakes. They've become eutrophic and they flip from a clear water state to a, a turbid state. And the argument that Bob made was that, well, if we could enhance the numbers of native mussels that we might be able to flip, flip it back. Yeah, that is, you know, tilting at windmills, I think. And I was skeptical of this project, but I really wanted to go to New Zealand. So I, you know, I went along with it. And it's actually been very interesting. And I think we've gathered some interesting data. This past January, we were there and we were looking at biodeposits. We're trying to build a system where we can look at biodeposit formation in the field. And we started out in the laboratory and set the animals up in these little raceways. And it turns out if you arrange things just right, you can partition the pseudofeces which are here, and the feces, which are there. These animals were fed with uh, kaolinite clay, and we wanted to measure the rates of filtration in response to different levels of this suspended uh, mineral uh, sediment, kaolinite clay. But ultimately, what we want to do is take this to the field, and we made the first step to that this year, too. This is the lake that we're going to be working in. We went out and collected a bunch of animals and marked them and uh, put in a floating system where we can hold these animals. This is not the system that we're going to use eventually for measuring biodeposit formation in the field. That's supposed to come next January, but with the virus, I don't know if we're going to be able to pull it off or not. Well, I'm running a little long here. We're already at an hour. 
but I think the rest of this will go pretty fast. I've argued for an ecological significance of freshwater bivalves, including our native mussels. They have economic significance too, at least historically, and that's the shell and, uh, and pearl industries. Native Americans use them as raw materials. This is a shell hoe recovered from a, a rock shelter. They were used as scrapers for hides and for pottery. They were used as temper for pottery. They were used for ornamentation. This is a, a gorget that is made out of mussel shell. But when the Europeans got to North America, uh, they were seen as a potential source of raw material. And a guy named Beppel was a button maker in his native land in Austria. And when he came to the States, he realized that there was a lot of freshwater shell and it was high quality. And he established an industry starting in Muscatine, Iowa that eventually spread throughout the Mississippi basin and became a multi-million dollar industry. And it was like a mining industry because these things were relatively abundant and easy to harvest. So these huge piles of shell, initially they would actually transport the whole shells, but as the industry wore on, it had a, a run of about 50 years, uh, they started to just drill the shells on mobile barges and then just move the button blanks. But there were factories all over the place, uh, as far west as Iola, Kansas, as far north as Ontario, and uh, they manufactured buttons. This was uh, this a high-end button. It's not a cheap wooden button. This was for dress shirts. And because it was a fairly pricey item, you know, they were value, valuable. We still wear shirts, not this one, I've got a t-shirt on today. But if you look at buttons on a dress shirt, they look like pearl. Well, they're made out of plastic now, but the tradition of pearl buttons goes back to this industry. It's a vestige of, of native mussels being harvested as raw material, an echo, if you will. And the abundance was incredible. Now this is 1940. So there were people with, uh, you know, movie cameras. This was even in color. It doesn't have sound, but these guys are out uh, in a river, the Grand River in Ontario, and they're going out probably on the weekend to harvest mussels. Well, what do you have to do? Well, you just pull your barge out there into knee deep water. And I'm gonna jump ahead here because this is kind of a long clip. But then, you know, you just, get in there and you start picking them up. And these aren't rocks, they're thrown into the barge. These are mussels. All they have to do is reach down and there's a mussel right there. The rivers were paved with these things. And then you boil them out. You know, you, you throw them into a big trough and you put a fire under, put some water in it and you boil out the shells. And look at the pile these guys have. Now, I don't think this is one day's work here. Now they're selling these things for, you know, if they're lucky, fractions of a penny on the pound. Always got to do the muscle thing, a visual pun, right? Muscles. It looks like fun and I'm sure it was, although you can only imagine what this smelled like. But, uh, you know, the industry couldn't do that forever. This was, it's like a mining operation and eventually all these beds were mined out and the abundance of the muscles really has never recovered. Pearl buttons were a thing up until the 40s and then the factories remained, but the factories switched over to using Bakelite and other plastics. But the shell industry didn't die because before it had quite gone extinct for button manufacturer, uh, a couple of Japanese guys found out that this was how you make cultured pearls is you take a bead of native mussel shell and you put it inside a pearl oyster. Actually, when I say inside, I don't mean just inside the shell. You have to put it inside the body of the pearl oyster along with a little bit of mantle tissue. And when you do that, the mantle tissue forms a sack around this bead of mussel shell and covers it over with the nacre of the pearl oyster. So when you buy a cultured pearl, it's a bead of, of river mussel shell surrounded by a thin veneer of pearl oyster maker, mother of pearl. And that's where pearls come from now. 
And in fact, they learned to do it in freshwater mussels, not in oysters. So here you're taking tissue, just the mantle tissue. These are not nucleated, but you just take mantle tissue and stick it inside the mantle, not the body cavity anymore, but you make a little cut in the mantle, which is two very thin sheets of tissue. And you stick a little bit of mantle tissue between the two sheets of mantle tissue. And you can do that multiple times on each side of the shell and it'll grow a pearl, no bead necessary. Of course, the pearls that grow are, are not all round. They're more, you know, odd shapes, but you can grow so many of them that you can pick out the round ones, or you can tumble them to make them round and then put them back in again for a second round. And this is where pearls come from now. Only the most valuable pearls are from the marine oysters. Most of them are from, from uh, freshwater mussels in Asia. The real significance, though, from our perspective is uh, conservation. And sadly, this is because mussels are in such uh, conservation difficulty. We had you know, roughly 300 species described from North America. And of those, more than 30 are certainly extinct and others are, are going to be extinct within our lifetimes. And there's uh, you know, a third or so that are listed as threatened or endangered. And this is, it's an ongoing thing. And you've got to say why, you know, these are some of the endangered species that we have in Missouri. Quite a variety, There's nothing uh, monotonous about the species that are endangered. And each one of them has peculiarities that have led it to being uh, critically endangered. So why are mussels declining? Are there any general rules? Well, there was this historic harvest and you know, it was, it was an awful slaughter, certainly billions, maybe trillions of mussels. You could figure it out because they kept records, but uh, you know, this killed an awful lot of mussels, but probably didn't cause any extinctions because when a mussel's abundance was gone, then it was no longer subjected to this harvest. You can tell that, uh, these shells from vicinity of Cincinnati, Ohio, they were just getting like one button, maybe two out of these little bitty individuals. So they're, uh, you know, they're, they're killing off the, the population here. They're harvesting mussels that, you know, are not reproductive yet in some cases. Kind of reminds me of the Khmer Rouge, you know, they piled up the skulls of their victims. Well, Again, that definitely reduced the abundance of mussels, but probably doesn't account for the extinctions. The vulnerability of mussels is in the life cycle. They've got this parasitic larval stage where they have to have the right kind of fish. And many of them are very host specific, maybe one or maybe just a few species of fish that can successfully be a host for the larva. So that's one thing. If something disrupts the fish fauna, like overharvest, or maybe invasive species of fish coming in, or changes in the habitat where the host fish just doesn't live there anymore, say it becomes a reservoir. Then another thing is the adults live a long time, and they're not very mobile, so they need stable benthic habitats in rivers. They don't tolerate sedimentation, they don't tolerate a lot of bed load movement, which is what you get when you have the floods that we've had recently. You know, they've got these tiny, tiny juveniles, and those juveniles have to settle into the substrate, but they can very easily be washed away. And if the river is high at the time that they come off the host fish, they may settle out on the bank somewhere. So fluctuations in water level, particularly high water during what's normally a low water time of the year, say in the summer, very bad for recruitment. They're susceptible to drift, to siltation, to micro predators, and they live in the sediment. So if you've got, say, mine chat in the sediment, it's going to kill the mussels long before it'll kill the fish. They're filter feeders, and that means that they're filtering the water and they're intimately exposed to anything nasty that's dissolved in the water. So if I had to list things, I'd say that dams are certainly number one. Impoundments uh, just, you know, erased habitat above and below the dam. So those are huge. And then chemical pollution is also huge, very sensitive to ammonia. Reduction of fish host populations is doubtless a major factor. These are things that affect all mussels. This one is maybe a little bit more specific because you know some fish populations 
have declined more than others. And then uh, finally, you've got direct competition from invasive species of bivalves. So if we're thinking about mussels, and we think about their ecological and their economic importance, well, that depends on their abundance. If mussels are abundant, then they have ecological and economic importance. But as they become more and more rare, that importance declines. And then when they get rare enough that they're in danger of extinction, well, then all of a sudden conservation concern clips in. But down in here, there's just no reason to uh, to protect, or there's no, no uh, infrastructure in place to protect mussels. You know, they have to reach a really critical level before they come under the protection of the Endangered Species Act. But the act is important. Uh, it's very important. It's got its problems. It's, you know, aimed at particular species. It would be better if it was aimed at their habitat, but, but there's workarounds. It protects animals and plants from extinction that result from economic growth and development and it brings resources to bear, protects the habitat, and it applies to all kinds of animals and plants, not just the ones that are important for economic purposes. Another very important piece of legislation protecting mussels and other aquatic organisms is the Clean Water Act. And the EPA is given the charge of establishing water quality criteria, the allowable limits for important pollutants like ammonia or lead or zinc, and those limits, those water quality criteria are calculated based on the sensitivity of aquatic organisms. And that's established by research by toxicologists. So this is a kind of bioassay. The calculation of these water quality criteria involves an algorithm that takes into account the sensitivity of representatives of several different animal groups. The minimum data set for the derivation of these these limits, these water quality criteria, is based on sensitive species, the most sensitive species in at least six of these categories. A salmonid fish, if that's relevant, if there are salmonid fish present, a second fish family, a chordate, could be an amphibian, often is, a planktonic crustacean, a benthic crustacean, an insect, this would be an aquatic insect, and then an, another invertebrate of some sort, it could be any kind of invertebrate, including a mollusk. And then it's supposed to have an insect or a mollusk. So there's two places where mussels can eventually or possibly contribute here. And in the old days, say 10, 15 years ago, there were very few mussel data, but now there's a lot of mussel data. And it's starting to drive these water quality criteria because mussels are among the top five most sensitive species for some very important pollutants, both uh, organic pollutants and inorganic. They're among the top 10 most sensitive species for sodium chloride, which is you know, used as uh, a way of uh, melting ice on roadways and copper, but ammonia here, potassium chloride, sulfate, nickel, all of these things, mussels are really sensitive. So their inclusion, the inclusion of their data can, uh, can really push these water quality criteria to, to lower limits. Adding data for sensitive species can make the water quality criteria more protective. The people that do this uh, work in government labs, they work in universities. We work with the, the folks up at the USGS lab in Columbia and we have for, for decades now. Uh, we grow baby mussels and we provide them for research as well as population restoration. And this is the most sensitive life stage, but increasingly there's a, there a great desire to make this a, a complete life cycle study for mussels that includes everything from the gametes to the adults. And we're working toward that. There has been some impact on water quality criteria. In 2013, the EPA lowered the allowable ammonia levels by half, and that was driven largely by mussel data. Sadly, not all states have adopted these criteria. Sadly, Missouri has not adopted these criteria. And there's, there's reasons for that. It's very expensive to push ammonia as low as EPA wants them to go now. So this is, it's an ongoing process. Uh, mussels can be monitored in the field. They, they can be the canaries in the coal mine. Uh, 
the monitoring of mussel populations is important for endangered species conservation, but it's also important as a way of detecting when there's problems. Mussel presence is a good indicator of water quality and the abundance of host fish. And if you get a kill, and sometimes this happens, the shells hang around. So there are evidence of events that may have been very brief, say a, a spill from a tanker truck or a factory violating its permit and releasing a bunch of effluent. Well, that effluent goes away and even the dead fish go away pretty quickly, but the dead mussel shells can hang around for decades. So bivalves in general, not just in freshwater, but marine bivalves are widely used for monitoring pollution, both by their survival and by assaying their bodies and seeing what they've incorporated. Mussels have become, uh, in some cases, an important part of NERDA assessment. And, uh, you know, NERDA attempts to evaluate ecological damage and restore wildlife and habitat that's been damaged by pollution events. And mussels are good for this because they're sensitive and because, again, the shells provide hard evidence. In 2009, the ASARCO mining interest, sort of an umbrella thing, ASARCO, uh, awarded $64.7 million in damages to uh, consortium of states and tribes that had sued because of pollution from historic lead and zinc mining. Uh, lead and zinc mining in, in southeastern Missouri by Doe Run, there was a settlement awarded $72 million in damages. This wasn't exclusively mussels, of course, but mussels entered into it. And mussels are involved in many of the plans for, for restoration. So I'm sorry I went on as long as I did, but uh, I am going to shut up now. Uh, mussels, to summarize, are an important part of rivers. They're a link in the food chain. If they're abundant, they can be a very important link in the food chain. They've got economic value historically and presently. I didn't mention that there's still a mussel shell harvest, and it's a million dollar industry, as well as the use of freshwater mussels in Asia for pearl culture. So uh, they still have economic value and they can improve water quality. They provide ecological services if they're abundant. And here we have to think beyond native mussels too. We have to recognize that the things that Asian clams and zebra mussels do, along with the bad things that they do, they do the same things that native mussels do in terms of, of be, being a trophic link. Endangered species are an environmental early warning system and I think that's important too. But maybe most important, if you look at the, the reproductive habits of mussels and if, if you become engaged with them, as I hope that some of you will now, learn the diversity of the species and, you know, it's, it's a treasure hunt. It's an Easter egg hunt every time you go looking for mussels. They're really wonderful animals. They're just kind of subtle and you, you have to make an effort to become engaged with them. And this will enrich your life. And I think it's important that we try to protect these things because then future generations can enjoy them as well. Amy, are you still there? I am. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. Again, like I said earlier, in the middle of your presentation. This is yeah, I'm awesome. sorry I ran a little long there, but. Oh no, it's fine. Um, this is such awesome, amazing information that I think that a lot of people just don't realize how important um, they, you know, these mussels, these organisms really are um, and how they fit into our aquatic environments. Now we do have a couple of questions. If you just have a moment, I think we probably have some folks who are probably starting to drop off, but um, are there any studies um, of using mussels to filter wastewater? That's a tough thing because uh, mussels are very sensitive to ammonia. So they're not really a logical part of a sewage treatment system. There have been attempts to use them in aquaculture though, where you've got a lot of suspended solids, fish waste basically. If, and if you can control the ammonia levels so that they're not too high, there is some potential there. But I, I think generally the sensitivity of mussels to ammonia makes it really tough to use them in any kind of a waste treatment context. Right. Um, and then the other important, uh, or the other question was, um, can you talk about the importance of uh, ephemeral streams with mussels? You tend not to find mussels in ephemeral streams, 
But ephemeral streams lead into permanent water, and permanent water is where mussels live. So, so certainly, you know, uh, reducing pollution impacts up high in the watershed is important. Reducing erosion up high in the watershed is important. You know, all the gravel that chokes our streams here in Missouri came from higher up in the watershed. Um, not necessarily losing streams, but probably a lot of them are losing streams. But, uh, you know, bivalves uh, by and large are, are less and less abundant as you move further upstream. And they're also less and less diverse as you move further upstream. Agree. Um, I think that's all the questions that we have. Um, and I thank everybody for coming and um, enjoying this presentation. I learned a lot and I've even seen it before. Um, and many of you probably also have as well, but every time um, I always learn something new. So again, I can't thank you enough, um, Dr. Barnhart, for uh, providing this information for us. Uh, all of this will be recorded and posted on to the Stream Team YouTube page. Uh, and then stay tuned and join us again uh, next Thursday, September 3rd. And we are going to talk a little bit more about muscles and um, Steve. Oh, I've got, I've got one more piece of news that I just remembered that, that Steve might be interested in. Uh, we found a southern maple leaf, Quadrilla apiculata, in the James River at River Cut. You may remember that site, Steve, if you're still there. And it, it's the real deal. I think that's a considerable range extension. It's up above the lakes in the James River. It's the, the only one I've ever seen, ever, anywhere. <laughs> So it's, you know, typically a southern species. It does occur. And it, it was uh, it was Allison Sia that found it. She's been looking at corbicula at that site, you recall, and uh, did, found a southern maple leaf. Did you keep it? We have photos, and we're, we're uh, going to pit tag it eventually. We know where it is. Okay. And, uh, you know, it's the real deal. Yeah, we can, we can swab it unless we get a you know, a hurricane induced spate that washes it away. But she thinks she saw it a year ago too at the same spot. She's got a picture, pretty clearly the same individual. So it's Great. a long-term well, resident, not a, not a newbie. I guess just looking at it that it's probably six or eight years old maybe. Very cool. Very cool. Well, and yes, um, Yes, next Thursday, September 3rd, uh, same time, we're going to talk a little bit more about muscle diversity. So I hope you all can join us. Um, and the links uh, for these Creek courses or small sessions that we have for the Stream Team Academy on muscle, um, introduction to muscles, is found on the Stream Team website. So please visit mostreamteam.org um, and share with your friends and have them join along with us as well. So. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Barnhart, for a wonderful presentation. We really appreciate it. So long, everybody. All right. Good night, everyone. All right. Now, I need to make sure that this saves. So I'm going to stop recording.